think, I think we'll have to ask whether the choice of music has anything to do with the fact that there are three women on stage now. But uh, <laughs> anyways, welcome uh, to our panel. We're very excited to be here because um, we've heard so much about how digitalization, how virtual reality, artificial intelligence is changing so many industries. But interestingly enough, there's one place where these technologies have not yet found their way into. And to illustrate this, I've brought something which is uh, spot the difference. If you look at these two pictures of a classroom, we all know what a classroom looks like. And if you look at a picture of what a classroom looked like hundreds of years ago, you can see there's not much of a difference. And that is something that we would like to discuss today with three fantastic people who would like to change that. And uh, I would like to ask you to join me in a hearty welcome. Tabitha Goldstaub, who, by the way, has the best name in the world, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Her two latest endeavors, she's a serial tech entrepreneur. And Cognition X is a platform and a network that enables companies to build artificial intelligence and data-driven solutions. She compares it to the Ghostbusters. If there's something strange and you're all alone, you call Tabitha and her 30 colleagues, which means she connects um, the firms with direct access to experts, to applications, to algorithms. And uh, she also has another project called Project Placed. That's a centralized software platform that connects universities with young talents who want to have vocational placements which count towards their degree. And Tabitha says, it is high time for new technologies to move into classrooms because the future has already begun and these children are studying and edu being educated for jobs that we don't even know yet. So please welcome Tabitha Goldstaub. Dominic Escoffier, our male panelist today, <laughs> he's the head of virtual reality for Europe, Middle East, Africa and India at NVIDIA. And NVIDIA is a technology enabler, which means Dominic and his colleagues provide their clients with the processing power that they need to drive autonomous cars, to build algorithms like universities. And he says, the bottleneck to educate society in a digital world, which is the name of our panel, is not the technology, it's actually the parents. And all of the parents will know, no one wants their child to be the first to be educated by machines. Please welcome Dominic. And last but certainly not least, Valerie Höllinger is co-head of the BFE in Wien, in Vienna, which is one of the largest adult education learning centers here in Austria. 45,000 men and women turn to Valerie and her team every year to get ahead in their career, and uh, they offer 4,000 4, courses with one focus being IT, because 20,000 IT jobs in Austria are open and very hard to fill and she predicts that all of us in this room will spend our entire lives learning, and actually we will change our jobs four times in a lifetime. Welcome, Valerie. Thank you. So, Tabitha, to, to start off with you, you are our expert on artificial intelligence, and there's been a lot on the news recently. So, to start off the panel, I would like to know, are you team Mark Zuckerberg, or are you team Elon Musk? Uh, I have to say, I. I don't really like to take sides in this. Um, we try and stay as broad as possible when we look at um, uh, AI and limit the utopian dystopian swing. Um, I prefer the products that Musk is building, though. OK. And so maybe you could describe, we started off with a picture of what a classroom, describe what will a classroom look like in 10 years from now? That's a big question. I wish I could draw it for you all. Um, I, I wish I knew. Uh, uh, I definitely don't know, and I think that we have to test and trial things, and we've heard that all morning. Um, we'll see uh, much more one-on-one -on -one experiences, so you'll have um, teachers in a virtual reality, um, or sorry, virtual, might be virtual reality, but in a virtual um, situation, teaching one-on-one -on -one each, each tutor, so they don't need to be sitting in a one-to-many experience. They could be sitting anywhere in the world. I'm hoping that what will actually happen um, is teachers will be able to spend more time with young students, um, because a lot of the other drudgery is taken away, whether it's marking um, or, or the things that teachers might not need to be doing, because artificial intelligence could do that instead. Mm -hmm. Dominic, what's your vision? What will the classroom, will we actually have classrooms? Will kids be going to school? <laughs> 
So there's a there's a pretty famous there's a pretty famous book um, that's being made into a movie in 2018 by Steven Spielberg. It's called Ready Player One. Mm. Ready Player One draws a future um, where all the students will be te will be taught in virtual reality. So essentially, they log into their device, they go to a school planet, and there they have access to the best teachers that that anyone can imagine. And adding to Tabitha's um, point. AI will have or, or could have a huge implication for that. I mean, if you're if you're getting trained by someone in virtual reality, you have one thing that is called lesser co lower cognitive load. So essentially, you're not being distracted by everything that that happens around you in the classroom. You just focus on one on one topic at hand. And then on, and and then if you add AI to that, there's a second big um, a big profit that you can generate through education in virtual reality is. Essentially, you could have the best teacher in the world that's also enhanced by artificial intelligence. So I could imagine something in the future where um, we have this technology deeply intertwined with education. Judging from the photos you have there, and also from the fact that my mom's a teacher, mm -hmm. and she's still driving around literally a VHS system with a CRT TV. <laughs> literally, I'm not even kidding. And the fact that the technology uptake in schools takes a long time. I would say that in 10 years, it's going to look just the same as it does today, Yeah. unfortunately. OK. And does your mom do that because she wants to do that, because she doesn't have the equipment to do anything else? She's, uh, for once, she, she doesn't have the equipment that's better. And second, if there's new technology coming, she, she doesn't get the, the tutorial and the, um, the knowledge transfer that she needs to actually use those technologies. I mean, my mom is. Um, was born in the year 53. So essentially, you, can, you can't tell her to use a smart board. It's just nothing that she grew up with, nothing that anybody educated her on. So that's a big part of the, of the politi politicians to actually drive that change in education. I, I don't know whether you can see that, but Dominic just has a look of a loving son who's tried to explain to his mom what a smart yeah, board is. Yeah, super <laughs> smart. Mom, if you're watching this, you're super smart, but I, I still have to do IT for her. So I log into her PC and tell her to do this, do, the, do that. So it is, but that's the problem with politicians, uh, with politics. They have to be the ones that tell 50 plus teachers how things are running now, now the, in, in our days. Okay. So, which is uh, Valerie sitting here, you have to tell your teachers um, how to prepare for the future. So, how is the BFI, how are you preparing yourself for the change that's coming? Mm. In the discussion, um, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, I'm the new Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So, I'm neutral, but watching what's going on, because I think AI um, could be a very strong tool in education, but we have to be very careful and strong rules. Um, and so we are, we are uh, teaching our teachers or trainers, it's mm -hmm. an ad adult uh, education, um, in educational ap approaches. For example, flipped class from micro learning, because I don't believe that in five years or, or in 10 years, there will be a 50 or a 45 minutes hour and one is speaking and 25 people are watching mm -hmm. or listening. So I think this will be flipped. And um, we teach also technology, technological approaches, for example, AR, VR, and so on. They're at the very beginning, and um, the young trainers follow us because they see their own beneficial, because mm -hmm. they will get a very powerful position, the teachers and the trainers, um, because of, uh, about their topics, their curricula. The older one, so we, uh, there we have to do a lot of effort to convince them. But you could teach Dominic's mom. Maybe. <laughs> I'm sure we can. Um, so I was reading in, in the run-up to this panel, it's fascinating stuff if you get into it. We all know that our pupils dilate when we find someone physically attractive, but apparently you can also tell from the way that your pupils dilate whether you are thinking, whether you're emotionally engaged, and whether you're about to make a decision, which means that the classic test scenario, you know, press the button if this is the right answer, that might be obsolete in the future. You know, these are things, so how is, how is the profile of a teacher going to change if they are not doing tests, if they're not marking? What kind of skills do they have to have? I mean, maybe you could tell us, Valerie, what are you teaching these teachers? The adult education focus on the skills the labor market needs. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's over to have curriculums only in math and in, in literate and, th and sports and so on. We have to mix it. Mm -hmm. And um, even the teacher have to improve a little bit. Because eye tracking, for example, I think you will um, tell about this. Um, is, I see it very critically because there could be discrimination. Because what are we doing with people squinting? 
mm -hmm. Chilen in, in Deutsch, yeah. Yeah? things like this. Uh, so um, we take these new technologies in a very careful way. Mm -hmm. But who is going to set the rules for these? I mean, may, maybe to you, um, because obviously there are a lot of positive things. You know, you're more engaged. Rather than have someone tell me about the Roman Empire, I can actually, with virtual reality, I can walk through ancient Rome and it sticks with me. But um, how do we guarantee that that information is correct, for example? So, so who is going to set these rules? But how do we guarantee it in traditional education? Mm -hmm. That's the same, that's the same kind point. of question. There's got to be a, 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 a gremium of experts that come together and define these, these educational contents. It's the same, it's the same thing as, it, as, as it's been 200, 500 years where people decide this is the important stuff that modern children have to learn. So essentially you're not taking away the decision part, but what you're, what you're taking away is the way it's being, trend, it's, it's being um, taught to the children. And that might, that might make a, a couple of, of teachers sour, actually, because, of course, if you do something for 20 years, 30 years, you know how to do it. But then suddenly technology comes around and changes the way you're, you're doing something. And that happens a lot of time in modern, in modern society, um, where people are complaining about the fact that technology takes their jobs but in essence, it just changes their jobs. And that's the same thing for, for, uh, for teachers. Mm -hmm. Tabitha, you have nothing? I think um, the, it's exactly the challenges that we need to teach teachers to teach children to ask the right question, rather than know whether we're in Rome or not. Um, it's asking the right question and then interrogating the answer. And I think um, if we can do that, then when our jobs change, we, we're able to adapt quicker to that one. Darwin, <laughs> we're able to adapt quicker to that change if we are um, teaching children to do that. And what I'm quite excited about for teachers is that they inherently have that skill to be critical, to um, take two source texts and look at the difference in them, understand where something came from. All of that critical re reasoning is what we need now. It's why we have fake news. And AI can tell you you're in Rome. But the hope, I, I genuinely believe that teachers have um, the, the will and the want and the desire to be the people who are training our kids to be yeah, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Valerie, you would like to add something? Yes, I think um, uh, we are, as a new technology, engages our students because um, they have a completely different um, emotional experience during um, learning, mm -hmm. and so the retention is much higher. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the practical classroom shouldn't be replaced by VR. It should be part, it should be part of a blended learning strategy. And so the teacher is very important. One example, Welding, it's Schweißen in, in German. Mm -hmm. So you can learn via, uh, in virtual reality, how to, when, how to Schweißen, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think the final touch must be in the real. So you have to smell, and the heat, you have to smell the, the real metal, mm -hmm. and, as, and then you will know how to weld. Mm -hmm. right. And that's something yes. that you think new technology can actually provide us with? There's actually a welding app you can do in virtual reality. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, the final touch, I, I think this I, is very I, important. I, yeah? I do agree for the, for, for the final touch and for like how like, you just can't, rep at least at the moment, you just can't replicate as such mm -hmm. a finely tuned thing as welding. Mm -hmm. But yes, the, the general basics, like where to, to, where to put the welds, how to move the individual pieces, you can, you can do that already in VR. So I, I get all the advantages, as, as you say, you know, walking through ancient Rome is going to stick in my head more than someone telling me all just the dates, but how do we, A, we don't really know, and I'm, I'm just going to take the, the like, challenging part on this one, um, how do we know what long-term effects that has on children? You know, whether or not they kind of get, I don't know, lost in virtual reality. I think people have gone missing playing video games. So how do we prevent that from happening? I think I, I'll have to take that question, even though it's a tough one. Um, you avoid that by teaching the parents that virtual reality and augmented reality is just another medium like all the other media before. So there's a, it's a funny anecdote, but my... A friend of mine, her grandmother was told by, her, by their parents, by her parents, that she shouldn't read that many books because it's a waste of time. Okay. The same thing applies for TV, for radio, for the internet, for video games, and for virtual reality and augmented reality. So it's up to the parents to tell the children how much they should spend time in that medium. So that's one thing I always, I always, try, to, I always try to make a point of is 
it's on the parents, on the teachers, and on the people that the children look up to, to tell them how much media consumption is good, and if they have enough, go out and play with the ball. So how do we convince you that, like we said in the opening statement, it's the parents that may be the bottleneck because we all like the idea, but please don't teach my kid first. So is maybe adult education the, the breaking point where we get people to engage with new technologies and then have a generational shift, like Dominic says? I think all of us should, um, should um, uh, be part of the, of the, of the new education. Mm -hmm. I think the parents, the teachers, and so on. And I think we have to show the benefits because every job profile is changing now. So the car mechanics doesn't uh, repair cars anymore. He's repairing computers with wheels. Or um, the doctor who th does his surgery via, uh, via an assistant, or the lawyers who, uh, who have Ross, it's a 24 7 um, bits and bytes assistant, and so on and so forth. And I think parents have to recognize that their children will be going in this world, that, that, that as you mentioned um, in, the, in, the, in the introduction, um, that we are going in four times changing our jobs. And I think this must be, there must be awareness for, for exactly that. Is there something you would like to add? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so the one thing is the is the acceptance. The other thing is finance. Obviously, this is very expensive. Um, and at the moment, it's people like Bill Gates. He's just invested 240 million of his private money into personalized education because he says we need to get ahead. But obviously, it's a huge market. Who's going to drive this? Um, we had in, in the pre-interview, we were discussing, um, so is it the states that are financing it? Is it private firms? Um, maybe, Dominic, maybe you could talk about your experience in, in Africa where the education system is fairly privatized already. I would, I would say you have, to, you have to adapt it to the way that it's being done right now. So you can't, you can't reinvent the wheel when it comes to education because it's such a holy grail that parents don't touch it, politicians don't touch it. it re you really have to adapt to the situation that we're in. So in Europe, I would say it has to be government funded. In, Euro in Europe, it is very institutionalized. You have to go through many different institutions to actually make something happen. Um, the, the example that, you're, that you just named is a, is a project that I'm doing right now um, to bring immersive education to, uh, developed com to developing countries. And that I started off in Africa where it's a completely different scenario. Um, in Africa there's already an, an, existing, um, an existing procedure to get tech into classrooms and that is all privatized. So one of the examples is South Africa where, um, <coughs> sorry, where um, Woolworths, it's a big, mar it's a big uh, chain, they put tablets and smartphones and, and, and laptops into the classrooms, but there's a little sticker on it that mm. says Woolworths. And of course, it's a, tricky, it's a tricky thing to handle because how much advertisement do you want to have in your education? But I'd make the argument that it's better to have any laptops there that are branded than no laptops at all because they just can't afford it through government driven tax returns or anything like that. Okay, so initiatives <coughs> coming from, from the private sector, what do we, the others believe? Where, where's the money going to come from to drive this change? I think, um, I think there's a, a lot of risks associated with the private sector getting more involved in education, but at the moment there isn't actually a, a, another option. And yes, philanthropy and the X Prize, uh, it's, all, it's all very well and good, but I think co corporates need to lean into education and actually um, find a way that they can, um, uh, they can provide what are the big questions that are going to get asked and actually um, open up uh, a dialogue between these school leavers who leave school and, and aren't being able to find the right jobs and yet there's a massive um, uh, number of corporates who are going, we can't find talent and talent going, I can't find a job. And I think we have to much earlier in, in the, in the uh, process get companies to be setting tasks and challenges and it, whether or not they're commercial or not, but at least opening uh, young people's eyes to what it, it's like to work at you know, 12, 15, 16 rather than at 26. You know. Something that I find very interesting, the BFE did a big study with 300 C-level managers and top executives and asked them, how well do you feel prepared for the digital change? And four out of five said, really well prepared, no problem whatsoever. <laughs> oh. And you kind of think, um, okay, so you know, we in our little bubble are discussing all these challenges and everything that are happening, but people out there, are they, are they naive, these people that you were talking to, or do they just not know what's coming, or are they really so well prepared? 
A part of both, I think. Uh, I guess there are a few, a, a lot of executives that are really prepared. But I think it depends on the company they are working in. The, the companies which have the, the digital transformation on a high-level topic, there the executive says, yes, I'm prepared and I'm willing to invest in trainings again. But, and here comes the catch, a lot of companies in Austria, small enterprises, small media enterprises, don't even have a digital agenda. And I think there the executives, there the people aren't prepared very well. Mm. And um, if you see there is a, is a big um, vacancies in the ICT sector, 20,000 you, you, you mentioned before, um, are looking for people with ICT know-how. We don't have it. So I think they are not prepared. It's a sign for this. If you saw the, um, the uh, AWS talk just earlier about, their, about the boats, they're probably prepared to put another sail mm -hmm. on the Skoda rather than build a steamboat. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the real challenge is people feel they're prepared because they've just got up to speed with email or they've just worked <laughs> out how to get a website. And we're, we're talking like leagues in a different, in a different world, but it's happening uh, as we've heard all day quicker than, than ever before. Okay, so they feel comfortable because they don't really know what's about to hit them. I worry. <laughs> Um, another question, because I, I, I know that this is something that's very close to Valerie and Tabitha's heart, is who exactly is defining how this um, development is happening? And Tabitha is starting to nod because something that you find um, very frightening is the fact that it, at the moment it's a very male-driven development. Maybe you could just elaborate why you feel so strongly. Yeah. Um, I think history has shown that when um, products and services are built by, um, by a homogenous set of people, you get uh, machines and systems that aren't able to um, actually be good products for everybody. And my favorite example um, was for decades, cars were tested with male-sized um, proportion test crash dummies. And so women were then dying in cars. And um, across the board, you can see um, cases where the, this has happened to, to, to lesser or greater threat. Um, uh, you know, Apple stood on stage uh, when they launched their Apple Watch and said, everything is being tracked you'd ever want to know. And they stressed, ever want to know. And no one put their hand up and said, you're not tracking my menstrual cycle. Mm. And we, we, we've got to a situation where um, it's not bad people. And I, I really never propose that this is bad people. This is an unconscious bias that seeps into the technology that we build. And the only way really to root this out is to be aware of it talk about it, be open about it, uh, admit that it took until 2016 to have female you know, emoticons, um, be concerned that a lot of our virtual assistants have got female voices, the, the, the virtual assistants in schools undoubtedly will be, will be female gendered. We have to just keep raising the, the point so that we're not starting to um, uh, allow our existing current misogyny to be built into the machines that we that we're letting loose on the world. <laughs> but how would that flow into like, artificial intelligence? Can you give us an example? So uh, uh, if you think about how um, a machines are taught, uh, that, you know, they're not coded anymore, they're taught to learn um, by data, you know, with data sets and with algorithms, and those data sets uh, can be inherently biased themselves. So if you have a data set that only includes um, uh, let's say you're trying to, hire, uh, trying to hire and you want to use artificial intelligence to find the right people in the world to hire. And your data set only includes men because you've only ever hired men. Mm -hmm. You can't possibly <laughs> end up hiring, uh, hiring women. Um, and we've seen Google has, has trouble showing um, women higher paying jobs because the, 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 the bias in the data set skews that they don't, um, they don't click on them. So, Across, across the whole board, it, it, the best thing to think about when you look at technology is how did this make a decision? Who trained it? What was its goal? Mm -hmm. what, was this, what was its uh, objective? And then work that back to see if there was bias included in that. Um, and there's a lot of really cool tech that can help you. If you're an all-male team, you can unbias your machines, mm -hmm. but you have to want to. And so um, my quick fix is let's get more women into those teams um, and, uh, and maybe we'll have less unconscious bias. Okay, and getting more women into the tech teams is something that Valerie is working on as well. You're trying to sell technology, make it clear that it's not just about pure coding, um, but it's also actually a very creative task. How are you going about that? 
I agree completely with the Peter, because I think we need people who can live in conversions, who can live in interdisciplinarity, who can build teams, who can lead teams all over the world, who has high communication skills, um, and so on. And I think historically, these are women's strengths. So I think the future is female and the technical future too, because I think we have to change the notion of tech, of technique, of technical things. The 80s, where the nerds are coding, they are over. So there is much more needed to, to be a technician today. And so I think this is a big, big chance um, for women. And that's the reason why they should also be part of the education change. Mm -hmm. yeah. This whole, this whole discussion is actually a pretty big topic in, in the virtual reality industry right now where VR is a young industry, so we can still shape how it's going to end up in 20, 50, whatever, 100 years. And there's a lot of drive um, bringing more um, women into tech. And I actually like the fact that there's uh, three women sitting on a, pa on a panel of four, <laughs> finally, because that really, it's, it, it really doesn't happen that often. And it's very striking. Um, I, I'm organizing a, a conference, or at least a part of a conference myself, shameless plug, GTC Europe in, in, in Munich in two weeks, uh, if anybody's interested in AI, VR, and robotics. But it's super hard to find female speakers. Mm. So I've actually made a point in, like, when searching for, the, for, for speakers, in, in putting more women that I know are doing a great job. I'm not doing it because they're women. I know I'm doing it because they're doing a great work. And it's super hard. It is it's actually really hard. Maybe because men are just more likely to go on stage and pretend they know everything. I don't, I'm, I'm not really sure what it is, but it, it, there's a huge chance for, um, for virtual reality to, to become one of those industries that's shaped in a different way and that, that, that takes that stigmata away that, that tech usually has for the, for the female crowd. Well, I think we all agree that diversity in any shape or form is always a good thing and more inspiring. Um, unfortunately, Tabitha herself believes that uh, one day her job will be taken over by bots. She has a very good daily newsletter, which I can recommend, um, which she signs with Tabitha until the bots take over Goldstaub. Yeah. Um, so when exactly do you expect your own job to become superfluous? Uh, I hope that the newsletter is something I don't have to write next year, let alone uh, <laughs> in the future. I. Um, I believe that tasks are going to get replaced, not jobs. So I won't have to write the newsletter. I hope I won't have to. Um, I hope I won't have to ever manage my calendar again. You know, there's a whole host of things that I think that we as humans don't need to be doing. Um, and my job, I like to think, takes a little bit more um, of my cerebral thinking and my problem solving and, and being able to uh, stand up here and then and then even cross the road and then go and play a game of chess. The, even those three things are things that one machine can't do today. So uh, I think my job is OK. But a lot of my <laughs> tasks are all gone. <laughs> Wonderful. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up because on a very tight schedule. If we met again in five years' time, um, one thing that you want to have changed by then, or you want someone to have changed for you by then? My Talking my about education, educa my educators. My personal goal would be... Educa would be um, driving forward that project of mine in, in developing countries because I believe that using the learning advantage that virtual reality has for developing countries will actually help shrink the gap between the Western civilized world and, and um, developing countries because there's a direct, co a direct correlation between, um, between the standard of living and the level of education. So if you drive education upwards, you're also going to make a standard of living for these people better. So I hope that in five years I'll, I'll have managed to at least digitize a couple of classrooms in developing countries, and hopefully, uh, Europe, isn't, hopefully Europe isn't taking the same, the, same, um, the same approach, because otherwise it's just going to end up the same. And, but that would, that would be my personal goal in five years. I hope to tell you the story of, of that in five years. OK. Mabisa? You go next. Um, I wish that we have uh, trained nearly three quarters of the um, Viennese people in digital competences and mm -hmm. that, that, that the education will be much more customized, personalized, individualized, and that we have a lot of innovat innovative um, spaces, learning spaces here in Austria or especially here in Vienna. Mm -hmm. 
I've thought of a really new one. I haven't thought of this before. But what if we could um, pay people rightly for their data that they're giving to Facebook and Google and trade it in for education stamps? So you get the more you use think technology online, the more education you get. What, so the more personal data I put out there, the more I can, wow, right. okay. So we're putting, it out, have, we're putting it out there pay anyway. for my education. No, we're putting it out there anyway, and no one's paying us for it. Can we put it on the blockchain? So yeah, like right. Let's just, yeah, distributed ledger at paid for education based on data. What about that? That could actually work. Yes, okay, I think you we've got a business fast. model going here. <laughs> so wonderful, thank you ever so much for your thoughts on this. Um, and we see we've got a, a whole load um, that we're gonna be working on. It's gonna be a long journey. I think we give up on your mum learning anything else than DHS, <laughs> but we'll try anyway. Thank you very much. Please give a warm round of applause for the pundits.